This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. Well, that episode of Eyes on the Prize um, about the freedom rides, I think, talks about a really important period of the freedom struggle. And uh, the freedom ride brought together all the basic elements that would really dominate the struggle for the next five years or so. If you think about it, uh, this is, these are people who had been involved in the sit-ins uh, throughout the South, and now they take that effort, which is mostly concentrated in the Upper South, where uh, they, they faced arrest, but not a huge amount of violence. And now they're taking it into Alabama, Birmingham, Montgomery, Montgomery where uh, Martin Luther King had, um, and uh, the Montgomery bus boycott had happened. Birmingham, where the person on the ground is Fred Shuttlesworth. Fred Shuttlesworth is, will emerge as the leading force in the Birmingham campaign of 1963. Um, you begin to bring the leaders of the, um, the sit-ins all together uh, to keep this campaign, to keep the Freedom Rides going into Mississippi. Uh, so you really have the, the most dedicated, uh, the most determined of the sit-in leaders all congregating together and all being brought together in jail cells in Mississippi and spending the rest of the summer there. And like in many freedom struggles, the imprisonment experience serves um, a very useful purpose for the movement. I mean, it's, it's not the best way of, of spending the summer, probably. But nonetheless, <laughs> it, it brings together people who otherwise would not have spent very much time together. A Fred Leonard and a Stokely Carmichael, a John Lewis from Nashville, um, people from Atlanta, all of them coming together and being able to share stories about their movements, uh, share ideas. You have the more religious focused people from Nashville. They're coming in with their uh, uh, emphasis on Gandhian nonviolence, taught to them by James Lawson. Um, the, the people from Howard University, much more secular, people like Stokely Carmichael uh, with some experience in leftist political movements uh, and in the, in the North. Um, one thing you don't have are a lot of students from Mississippi and Alabama. But the fact that the movement kind of comes to them stimulates their activism because they begin to ask, well, why don't we have sit-ins here? Now, there hadn't been sit-ins. There's not a lot of lunch counters in the small towns of Mississippi, but even in Jackson there hadn't been sit-ins. Um, the sit-ins that took place in, in Montgomery and in, in Alabama had been treated much more harshly. Uh, students being expelled and other um, longer sentences. So all of this kind of converges on the Deep South, what is called the Black Belt. It's also in these er this area that you have the greatest potential for a mass-based social movement. Because in the Black Belt, you have, in many counties, a black majority. So you begin to see the need to um, take this movement into the areas where most black people in the South are living. Now it turns out that during this campaign, Another person enters the struggle who was going to play a very important role, and that's Bob Moses. Bob Moses had become involved during the 1950s, mainly through the efforts of Bayard Rustin. Um, as you recall from my lecture about Rustin and about Ella Baker, they had brought together a, a support group in New York to help the Southern struggle. They had established an office called In Friendship, 
Um, and Bob Moses, as a school teacher, had come to volunteer his time. Uh, from his memory of that time, it was basically stuffing packets of mail, helping with uh, fundraising events, just doing whatever he could um, as a, a math teacher at Horace Mann School. Bob Moses, in terms of his background, had uh, studied at Harvard, got his master's degree, and had become, uh, started teaching school, and also had developed a certain attitudes about uh, social struggle. He had um, been influenced by the Quaker movement, um, the Quaker <coughs> peace movement, and had actually taken part in uh, youth camps uh, during the summers where um, he learned more about uh, their philosophy. In college, he had studied existentialist philosophy, read the works of Camus. Existentialism served as, as one of the bases for his, uh, uh, the, the attitudes he later developed, um, particularly Camus, who as a French philosopher had kind of been between um, Jean-Paul Sartre, who had moved toward the Communist Party uh, during the 40s and, and 50s, and Camus, who was always skepti skeptical about all organized, um, kind of <coughs> centralized political movements, but was a radical in his own right. I mean, he had taken part in the French resistance, and he had offered kind of a middle course between uh, accepting the existing order and being maybe a liberal or reformer within that order or trying to start a revolution to overturn that order. So for Camus, the, the role of the ra radical, the rebel, was to take on the existing order but not to create what he thought were the conditions of oppression that might replace that order. That is, not to accept any kind of hierarchical um, movement to um, to bring about a revolution. And so that's, this was Moses' background when he uh, started getting involved in the 50s, uh, supporting what became the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. So when Rustin suggested that during the summer of 1960 that Bob Moses go to the South and help out Ella Baker, who had taken over the headquarters of the SCLC, Bob Moses accepted that assignment and came to Atlanta during the summer of, of 60. It turns out that uh, many of the students thought that he was a communist. Uh, why? Uh, because he was this northern black who had come to the south, he was articulate, uh, he seemed to know a lot about uh, politics, so there was this rumor going around that uh, that this communist had come down to help the movement. And, and actually that led to his first meeting with, with Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King heard these rumors and had called him into his office. And the two of them kind of had this, uh, this encounter. And the way Bob Moses remembered it when I interviewed him was that um, they, neither of them really understood each other. You know, by that time, Bob Moses had really been influenced uh, strongly by Ella Baker and it kind of adopted many of Ella Baker's ideas about King, that King was too cautious, that he was not, um, um, that he was too, that people were becoming too dependent on King's leadership. Um, he felt that Ella Baker's idea of a grassroots struggle was much better. And by this time, this is the summer of 1960, SNCC is actually meeting or at least has their, their own headquarters in a corner of the SCLC office. And Ella Baker is being pushed out of SCLC and she's becoming much closer to the young students in SNCC and beginning to advise them. So it's in this context that uh, Ella Baker says to Bob Moses as the summer goes on, why don't you go on this field trip to Mississippi? Why don't you find out uh, what's going on there? We, we haven't gotten very much support for 
for SNCC, none of the students in Alabama and Mississippi seem to be very active. So why don't you go down, uh, go to Alabama and Mississippi and Louisiana and try to attract people to come to the October conference of SNCC. And this was the first time that um, Bob Moses had been in these areas and, and he meets up with an NAACP leader by the name of Amzi Moore. And Amzi Moore was working in the Delta of Mississippi, uh, an area that had a black majority. And Amzi Moore talks with Bob Moses and convinces him that, well, there are different conditions really here in Mississippi. It's not about sitting in to integrate lunch counters. It's about registering people to vote. If we can register people to vote, we can take over these counties because we have the majority. It's just that black people are not able to vote. And he gets a promise from uh, Bob Moses that the following summer, after he finishes up his teaching in New York, that he will come to Mississippi and help Amzie Moore set up a voter registration school and start training people to go down to the voter registration office and take the voter registration test. Now during that time, um, there's this article that appears in Jet Magazine about Bob Moses' uh, plan to go uh, to Mississippi. And a man in, in um, Macomb, Mississippi reads that, uh, C.C. Bryant, um, E.W. Steptoe, two of the people who were leaders of the NAACP in southwest um, Mississippi. And when Bob Moses returns, he finds that there's n the conditions are really not set up for him in the Delta. You know, there's no place where they can go to set up this registration school. And C.C. Bryant, who was the local head of the NAACP in Macomb, invites him to come there instead. And that's where Bob Moses shows up at the beginning of August 1961. Now, now if you put these two things together, the Freedom Rides, here you have the students coming to Mississippi, uh, they're kind of bringing the movement in, they're staying in, in Parchman Penitentiary during that summer, and at the same time, Bob Moses is going to Mississippi to set up this voter registration school. And there's also this division that takes place, which I write about in the SNCC book, within SNCC, between the people who are in favor of protesting for desegregation, kind of led by Diane Nash and um, um, Marion Berry and others, and those who were in favor of voter registration. And Ella Baker works out this compromise where they set up two wings, they each can do what they want, those who want to do voter registration can do that, those who want to continue uh, the sit-ins and, and other kinds of protests for desegregation can do that. So all of this is happening, and at the same time, some money arrives in the form of a foundation grant to support voter registration. So at that point, SNCC is able to hire its first staff members, and Bob Moses becomes one of the, I, I think, the first staff member of SNCC. And Macomb becomes the center, southwest uh, Mississippi becomes the center of a new struggle. Several of the students who get out of jail at the end of the summer decide that rather than going back to school, they're going to become SNCC workers, SNCC field secretaries. <clears throat> Since Bob Moses is already in southwest uh, Mississippi, that becomes the new center, uh, that along with Albany, Georgia, where some of them also go um, to establish an office. Now at that point, uh, Bob Moses had just begun to um, make some breakthroughs in southwest uh, Mississippi. And fortunately, we have kind of a, a, almost a diary of his activities once he arrived in, in Macomb. And just a, a little bit of the flavor of that. 
the kinds of things that you would face if you were a, a civil rights worker trying to convince people to go to the county seat. Registering to vote was very difficult in Mississippi. Not only once you got there, you had to take this test um, to uh, interpret some section of the Constitution of, of the state of Mississippi, and then you had to fill out a section where you describe uh, the obligations of a citizen. Uh, so what he did is began to set up classes where he would train people on how to, how to take this test, and then he would accompany them to the county seat. You had to go to the county courthouse uh, in order to register to vote. You had to wait until the time when it was open. And um, I don't know how many of you have ever been to any of these uh, rural areas of Mississippi or Alabama. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you have. <laughs> Uh, it, it is even today, it's, it's kind of an interesting experience because there's usually uh, a, a square and people kind of hang out there because these are basically rural uh, communities. Um, so uh, there's going to be you know, mainly older people who kind of hold, hang out around the county square. And everybody notices everyone else's business. I, I went there later. I, I remember going to Lowndes County and, and just to kind of give you, this is in the early 70s, but it wasn't really that different. Uh, I remember driving up because I wanted to do an interview with the person who had become the sheriff of, of Lowndes County, a black guy who had been elected. And uh, so I, I drive up and every eye in the square is on me. I mean, it, it's like, you know, first of all, I had California license plates, what I should have changed before getting there. Um, but um, by the time I got in, did the interview, came back, and then I drove to some of the rural areas to interview Bob Mance, who was one of the uh, SNCC workers who was still living there. By the time I got to his house, uh, people were saying, oh, you're the one who drove up uh, yes, um, earlier today at the county courthouse. The word had already passed you know, 10 miles out into the county that some new person was in town. And it was that, that kind of a, of a situation where Bob Moses would, would come in. And um, this is a des description of what it was like. I accompanied about three people down to Liberty in Amet County to begin our first registration attempt there. One was a very old man and then two ladies middle-aged. We left early morning on August 15th. It was a Tuesday. We arrived at the courthouse about 10 o'clock. The registrar come, came out. I waited by the side for the man or one of the ladies to say something to the registrar. He asked them what, they, what did they want? What were they here for? In a very rough tone of voice. They didn't say anything. They were literally paralyzed with fear. So after a while, I spoke up and said that they would like to come to register to vote. So he asked, well, who are you? What have you got to do with it? Are you here to register? So I told him who I was and that we were conducting a school in Macomb and that these people had attended the school and they wanted the opportunity to register. Register. Well, he said I'd have to wait because there was someone there filling out the form. And then he goes on, um, our people started to register. In the meanwhile, a procession of people came, began moving in and out of the registration office. The sheriff, a couple of his deputies, people from the tax office, people who do the driver's license, looking in, staring, moving back out, muttering. A highway patrolman finally came in and sat down in the office. And we stayed that way in sort of uneasy tension all morning. The first person to fill out the form took a long time to do it, and it was noontime before we were finished. On the way home, we were followed down the highway by a patrolman who had spent the day in the registrar's office, Officer Carlisle. He tailed us for about 10 miles all the way back toward Macomb. At one point we pulled off and he passed us, circled around and we pulled off and he passed us in the opposite direction. Then he turned around again and followed us again. Then he flagged us down and I got out of the car to ask him what was the trouble because the people in the car were very, very frightened. He asked me who I was, what my business, and told me that I was interfering in what he was doing. I said I simply wanted to find out what the problem was and what we were stopped for. He told me to get back in the car. As I did so, he jotted my name down. Get in the car, nigger, slamming the door after me. Then he told us to follow him and took us to Macomb, where he told, uh, told, I was told that I was placed under arrest. 
Um, by the way, he um, later calls from the Justice Department. He had been given the number of John Doerr, the Assistant Attorney General in, in charge of, of civil rights, and that gets him basically released. We had a trial after that. I was found guilty on this charge of interfering with an officer, and the county prosecutor went out, consulted, and came back, and I was given a suspended sentence, 90 days suspended sentence, and fined $5. I refused to pay the $5 court costs. I was taken to jail then. This was my first introduction to Mississippi jails. I spent a couple of days in jail, was finally bailed out. Now, later on, the violence began, and uh, some of this I, I covered in, in the book. Um, the, he was uh, beaten very severely by um, Billy Jack Caston, who was one of, the, uh, one of those who had been watching this registration attempt. I remember very sharply that I didn't want to go immediately back to Macomb after being beaten because my shirt was very bloody. And I figured if we went back in, we would probably be fighting everybody. So instead, we went back to Steptoes, where we washed down before we came back to Macomb. Um, by the way, one of the things he, he says he was concerned about was that if people saw him with his bloody shirt, that then that would basically discourage them from ever going to register uh, to vote. Um, all of this kind of culminates in several incidents where two other SNCC workers are, are beaten up um, very severely. And um, this leads to a an effort on the part of the young people in Macomb to start their own movement. They start a sit-in movement. Uh, they, they feel that the Freedom Riders have come, and now it's time for these young teenagers to uh, start their own movement, start protesting against segregation. This was against what uh, the NAACP leaders want, because they had brought Bob Moses and Snick in to um, help their voter registration campaign. But nonetheless, uh, Brenda Travis, a 16-year-old uh, girl in the high school, uh, was arrested for leading a sit-in. She was um, thrown in jail and um, expelled from school. And this leads to a um, division within the black community because they didn't want the young people involved in um, the sit-in campaign. They were frightened for them. They felt that they were facing enormous potential for violence in, um, in Mississippi. And then finally, on September 31st, uh, 1961, Herbert Lee is killed. Uh, Herbert Lee had been one of the people working with um, Bob Moses and, and the workers. Um, he's not only killed, but he's killed by E.H. Hurst, who happened to be a Mississippi state representative, that is, a politician. And he's killed in front of, in broad daylight, um, in front of about 12 witnesses. Um, before the day is done, he's uh, absolved by a coroner's <laughs> jury who, who um, um, argue that he had been threatened by Herbert Lee. Now, it turns out that several of the black witnesses to uh, the killing of, of Lee wanted to come forward. They were frightened to do that. Um, Bob Moses spends much of early October uh, searching for these people, trying to get them to tell their stories to him. Uh, they finally agree to tell basically what happened. Um, and he said, uh, that the story was basically this. They were standing at the cotton gin early in the morning and they saw Herbert Lee drive up in his truck with a load of cotton. E.H. Hearst followed him in an empty truck. Hearst got out of his truck, came to the cab on the driver's seat of, of Lee's truck and began arguing with Lee. He began gesticulating toward Lee and pulled out a gun which he had under his shirt and began threatening Lee with it. 
One of the people that was close by said that Hearst was telling Lee, I'm not fooling around this time, I really mean business. And that Lee told him, put the gun down, I won't talk to you unless you put the gun down. Hearst put the gun back under his coat and then Lee slid out from the other side on the offside of the cab. As he got out, Hearst ran around the front of the cab, took his gun out again, pointed it at Lee, and shot him. This was the story that three Negro witnesses told us on three separate nights as we went out tracking them down, knocking on doors, waking them up in the middle of the night. They also told us another story. Two of them admitted that they had been pressured by the local authorities, the sheriffs, the deputy sheriffs, and some of the white people in town that there had been a fight um, to say that there had been a fight, that Lee had had a tire tool and that he tried to hit Hearst with a tire tool and that Hearst had shot Lee in self-defense. Mm -hmm. They said this story was not true, but they had been forced to tell it for fear of their own lives. Lee, in any case, was a small man about five, five feet four, weighing about 150 pounds. Hearst was a large man, about six foot two, upwards of 200 pounds. It is inconceivable that he could have been so threatened by Lee that he would have had to shoot him. Well, um, once Lee is shot, a lot of the voter registration work just simply came to an end. Um, it turned out that one of the people who had changed his story was, um, was later attacked. His jaw was broken by the deputy sheriff who knew that he had told the FBI mm -hmm. Um, the FBI had uh, come back and, and, and reported to the local uh, sheriff that uh, one of the witnesses had changed his story. Now this leads then to the, the incident in, in, uh, in um, Macomb where the young high school students lead a march. Uh, they want to march to the courthouse to protest against the expulsion of the students uh, for the first uh, sit-ins. And this leads uh, to a decision among the SNCC workers. And it's a crucial decision that has a lot of uh, bad consequences for their work. They have to decide when the students come into the SNCC office and begin drawing up uh, posters and other things and saying that they're going to march to the county courthouse, which is five miles away. The SNCC workers have to decide what they're going to do. They, they don't want to participate in this. They know that this is um, perhaps going to be ill-fated, but they decide that they can't refuse to participate because the students are going to do it anyway. And they end up taking part in this aborted march, which never gets out of Macomb. They're attacked by a mob. Um, the uh, students are arrested, expelled from school. The SNCC workers are thrown in jail. Among the charges are contributing to delinquency of minors, uh, which uh, very, ends up a very serious charge. And they have to shut down their voting, uh, voting rights activity. Well, the Macomb campaign and the campaign that's going on at the same time in Albany, Georgia, can be seen as two failed campaigns, that is, they don't succeed in registering very many people, and in fact, hardly any. Um, they face an enormous amount of violence, but they do succeed in bringing together the core of the staff that is going to take the um, voting rights campaign into the black belt. In both Macomb and later, after they leave Macomb, go to Jackson, um, Bob Moses begins to bring together the basis of his staff, uh, all recruited from Mississippi. In Albany, Georgia, Charles Sherrod begins to bring together his staff, some of them recruited from Albany, Georgia, others from outside the South, basically religious uh, motivated people who come and want to participate. And these two centers, Southwest Georgia, the Delta of Mississippi become the crucial places where the next stage of the, of the movement takes place. Um, it's there that you begin to see a um, full-time staff 
of field organizers begin to develop the tactics that um, begin to show some success, that is working with local leaders, uh, people who have been usually involved with the NAACP since the 1950s, uh, trying to get these people to support them by taking them into their homes, uh, by getting local young people active in the movement. And um, this effort, I think, is, is really what the struggle of the 1960s was um, centered around. Uh, for the rest of the decade, the people who come and begin to work full time in these communities, um, this is something that is new in the civil rights movement. Uh, the NAACP had no equivalent of it. SCLC has no equivalent of it. Uh, the idea of organizers moving into communities and making a commitment to stay for a long time was something uh, new and different and it had uh, I think a lot of permanent consequences. One of the consequences is that many of these people are still there. Um, if you go to Mississippi and Alabama, especially the smaller communities, people like Bob Mance um, are still living there. Uh, Charles Sherrod is still living there. Uh, some of them have now moved into political uh, positions, um, you know, county offices, um, as they succeeded in, in registering the black vote. Um, most of them um, are strong believers in kind of the Bob Moses approach to organizing. Uh, this approach, uh, which I think I said in the previous lecture, is very much influenced by Ella Baker and the notion of, of working yourself out of a job, trying to find local leaders to carry on the struggle, seeing yourself as a catalyst rather than a leader. You know, all of these um, approaches, I think, were refined and developed in the rural areas of Mississippi and Alabama. A little bit about Bob Moses and what happens to him. Uh, he stays in, in Mississippi uh, in 1962. The various civil rights organizations in Mississippi get together and form a group, an organization called the Congress of Federated Organizations, COFO. COFO became the way in which the NAACP, CORE, SCLC, SCLC, which really doesn't have very much impact there, um, and SNCC cooperate and becomes the channel through which money to support voter registration arrives in Mississippi. Bob Moses becomes the director of COFO's uh, voter registration effort. And SNCC really provides the, the um, bulk of the organizers on COFO's staff. Now I wanted to um, show a, uh, another segment of, of Eyes on the Prize that, that deals with the subsequent development of the movement in Mississippi. And uh, this culminates, and I, we won't get there on today, this culminates uh, with the develop of the founding of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party in 1964 and the challenge to the main regular Democratic Party at the 1964 Democratic Convention in Atlantic City. This is the crucial event of the Southern struggle because it's the point at which the proponents of voter registration place their case before the liberal forces in the Democratic Party and they basically say, you have a choice to make. You can either support the regular Democrats, which is an all-white political party, or you can support the Freedom Democratic Party, which we've established and it's open to anyone who wants to join, but it's not the official party. 
of the state of Mississippi. And by placing that choice between before the national administration, before Lyndon Johnson, they forced Johnson to take a stand. Does any, who knows what happens at that? You've done your readings, right? Yes. Like he decides that he will, he tries to make compromise and they get two at-large seats. Um, okay. Yeah, he offers these two at-large seats at the Democratic Convention. Uh, what does the Democrat Freedom Democrats say to that? They're like, we don't want those seats. Yeah, I mean, they, they reject the compromise. This becomes kind of the, the crucial decision because from that point on, you begin to see a, a real division. Bob Moses um, moves from Mississippi to Alabama. Stokely Carmichael goes to Lowndes County in Alabama. Uh, there they form the, Freedom Demo uh, the Lowndes County Freedom Organization, which becomes the Black Panther Party. Um, and that is the first political party independent of the Democrats, and it represents a new thrust in black politics. And it's basically saying, yes, we have mobilized these people in the Black Belt of Mississippi. We've brought them into the political process, but we don't want to bring them in simply as part of an untransformed Democratic Party. Um, we want to build a new and different kind of political force. Uh, Bob Moses himself, by that time, gets drafted and uh, uh, has to decide what to do. He decides to leave the country, um, first to Canada for a while. Then he decides to go to Tanz Tanzania, uh, leaves uh, the United States, uh, or at least uh, for Tanzania in the late 60s, stays there, um, actually raises his family there, uh, through the mid-1960s and returns in the late 60s uh, to the United States. Uh, so he kind of takes himself out of the uh, freedom struggle, in part for reasons of the draft, but I think in part also because of the philosophy. If your job is to work yourself out of a job, one of the things that he felt was um, uh, bad about the outcome of the Mississippi struggle is that people became dependent on him. Mm -hmm. And the only way he could figure to get out of that dependence was to take himself out of the Mississippi movement and allow the people that he had worked with to assert themselves um, as independent leaders. Let me show you a bit of the Mississippi part of this. Unfortunately, are there any questions while I'm setting us up? Because it always takes a little bit of time to get through the menu. Yeah. After yeah. the uh, freedom, freedom riders were jailed in um, Parliament Penitentiary, what was the interstate? Was that like interstate contact or something that came out of that? Was it victory? Yeah, it, it goes back actually to the 1940s when um, there had been, uh, Irene Morgan had, had pushed the issue of can there be segregation in interstate commerce? You know, the idea was that under state law, under the Plessy decision, it had been possible to have segregated facilities as long as they were equal. But if you're going in interstate commerce, the argument was that that should be a federal jurisdiction. If you're traveling between states, you shouldn't be bound by the segregation laws of a particular state. So there had been a Supreme Court decision in favor of desegregation, but it had never been enforced. So then we jump ahead to the freedom rights. Well, they want to see that in decision enforced, but it takes a federal agency to enforce it. And the, the Kennedy administration was not enforcing it. They went finally to the Interstate Commerce Commission and said, we want a ruling enforcing this decision. But that ruling doesn't come until October of 1961, after most of the Freedom Rides are over. After that, then it was still a question of, how do you actually enforce this on the ground? And, uh, and part of that happens in places like Albany, where people, 
the, the freedom right idea continues well into the 62, 63, um, really until 1964, the Civil Rights Act, uh, where um, students from Howard and other places would find segregated restaurants and would go there in order to uh, um, test these facilities. And this, was, this kept going on, I think, you know, well into 64. I think some of you already know the um, class on Thursday will be in Wallenberg, um, and it'll be a guest lecture by Vincent Harding, who is uh, a colleague, was a colleague of Martin Luther King, is going to be talking about his relationship, uh, his reflections on, on Martin Luther King, and particularly uh, the uh, Riverside Church speech, uh, anti-war speech that uh, King gave in April of 1967. Uh, Benson Harding, as well as Clarence Jones, were um, among those who helped uh, King write that speech. Uh, so I, you're welcome to, um, to invite other people to come. That's why we're, uh, we're opening it up to other uh, CSRE classes. And uh, there will be a luncheon afterwards up here on the third floor. Uh, so um, you can get your lunch and also have a time to talk with him more personally. Um, one thing I wanted to, to mention about Bob Moses, anyone know what he's doing now? I know you know. Uh, he's, he's running a, the Al Algebra Project. Any, anyone heard of that? It's a nationwide project to bring math education to uh, middle school kids. And the reason why he's involved with this is he thinks of this as the civil rights movement of the 21st century. He thinks that access to good education, especially good technological education, is essential for getting ahead in the 21st century. And he's been focusing on high schools, predominantly black and Latino high schools, uh, where in many cases they do not offer algebra at the same time that you would in other, in other schools, predominantly white schools, and therefore students get behind in the sequence and they, when they get to high school they cannot get on the college track. Uh, so he sees this as the crucial intervention and he equates this to voter registration in the 60s. Uh, so um, that's what he's doing is or organizing with today. There's several uh, schools um, that are affiliated with the Algebra Project in the Bay Area, one in San Francisco, one in Oakland, and uh, any of you uh, who wanted to get involved in that um, might uh, check out their website and uh, find out uh, more information. See you on Thursday. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.